Um, and we look at other places where that's happened. Uh, in Iraq, where after Gulf War I, where the international community pushed Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, which he had invaded and occupied illegally, and the international community, with the vote of the UN Security Council, something that has not happened over this last war in Iraq, where there was the Bush administration was unable to get uh, the, UN Security, or the, the UN Security Council to vote for international authorization to, mm, gosh, for what? For going in we weapons of mass destruction to Iraq. But 11 years, 12 years earlier, indeed, the international community had said because Saddam Hussein had invaded and occupied Kuwait that he must be pushed out. And following the removal of Saddam Hussein, pushing him back up into Iraq, that precipitated a 12-year quarantine, sanctions on Iraq, that were so detrimental to the civilians of the country, not to the, to the power brokers, the government officials, they always know how to get money and get things in, but even when our Secretary of State at the time, Madeleine Albright, was asked, was it worth those sanctions because there have been over 500,000 children of, of Iraq that have died of malnutrition or lack of medicines or whatever. And Madeleine Albright, without a, without a, a hesitation, said, yes, it was worth it. So our country has invo been involved in these sanctions. We're involved in uh, not only the sanctions against Gaza, but we're involved in sanctions against Iran and sanctions that are going to be upped and upped and upped no matter what the Iranian government does. Uh, with its last uh, uh, negotiations with the government of Turkey and the government of Brazil, where Iran says, yes, we will move part of this uh, uh, enhanced uranium, it will go into a uh, uh, secure area in Turkey, and that's not enough. It's not enough for the United States. And our Congress is already saying, no, that's, that's not enough, <clears throat> and we're going to put more sanctions on you. So sanctions, tragically, have been a part of our, um, our national foreign policy, and sanctions that uh, do injure people, that do harm children that do harm innocent civilians. Uh, the three years that this, this particular phase of the quarantine has been going on, uh, one of the Israeli uh, ministers of something or another, I can't remember exactly which position he had, but he said, you know, the people in Gaza, they need to go on a diet. And that's, uh, we'll put them on a diet. Well, the diet meant that uh, only 10% of the number of truckloads of food and material that normally had been coming through the Israeli crossings to go into Gaza uh, have been coming in over these last three years. It's been a real diminution in, in the amount of food and materials coming into the country. Um, people can't survive like that, and of course people that are pinned up and are put in essentially what the world is calling an open-air prison find ways to try to get around that prison or to get under that prison. And you've probably seen the photographs of the tunnel systems that have been built, been dug by young men, young Palestinian men, who in probably the only work there is for young men of 15 to 25 years old or 30 years old, is to go to the border crossing at, at Rafa and to work for 12 hours a day and maybe get $25 a day, a big sum there. They dig down 70 feet down, 70 feet, and then they go under the Egyptian border anywhere from 500 to 900 feet. And then they dig up, upwards into someone's backyard or into uh, the basement of a house or into a warehouse. And that tunnel system then starts moving food, um, animals, material, and the Israelis say weapons. And there probably are some weapons that come through that way. But I would su submit that the overwhelming use for those tunnels is just to keep people alive. And it's keeping them alive at a huge expense because every person along the way, every entity along the way gets their cut on it. The, the Egyptian merchants that order the food from, from Al-Arish or from Cairo, it's brought in by big trucks and then 
they get their cut as they deliver it to the middlemen and women in, in Rafa, Egypt. And then the guys that own the tunnels get their cut of bringing it under. And then the person that brings the truck up to the, the mouth of the, um, the tunnel on the Gaza side, they get their cut. And then it goes into the, uh, the city or the towns and people get their cut. So it's very expensive for the people of Gaza to stay alive. Um, the, the quarantine um, has a tremendously negative effect. Having seen that, what the effect was in the, the, my very first trip into Gaza in January of 2009, when we were allowed by some miracle of those thousands of people that were waiting at the border, that somehow the three of us got to go into Gaza, where hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of people were left behind that day. The Egyptians said, you three can go in. We had journalist credentials. We were saying we were journalists, and we are. All three of us write articles, and uh, uh, anyway, we, we were allowed to go in. Uh, we, we were told you can only stay 48 hours because we, the Egyptians, are going to close that border after 48 hours. And if you're inside, we don't know when we'll reopen it, and you'll get stuck. And indeed, it was true. When they closed that border 48 hours later, they did not reopen it for 20 days. Nothing moved through the border. No material, no, uh, no food, no nothing, no people. Um, you know, during that period, tens of thousands of Palestinians who had family in Gaza, who hadn't been in Gaza in years and years and years, they were flying into and to Egypt to try to get to the border to try to see if they could go in to see how their families were doing. That's another part of this whole quarantine where people are, families are split apart and cannot come together again. The people are in, that are in Gaza, it's very extraordinarily difficult for them to get out. Even with medical emergencies, it's very difficult. Even if young men and women who finally graduate from high school or are in the few universities in Gaza, and they get an international scholarship to get them out of Gaza uh, takes almost, uh, I mean, it's just extraordinarily difficult. Finally, the U United States finally started offering some, some Fulbright scholarships a couple of years ago, and it took the intercession of Condoleezza Rice uh, to get the Israeli government to allow those students who had been selected for Fulbright scholarships to come out of Gaza. People have been stuck in Gaza for years and years and years. It is a tinderbox smoldering with people who have not enough food, have not enough um, you know, access to the things that we take for granted every single day. It really is a prison. Well, when we saw this prison, we, we made a commitment that we would try to get as many people into Gaza as we possibly could in the next months to, so they could see this with their own eyes. And so for the next four months, Code Pink Women for Peace organized delegations to go into Gaza. We had two delegations, each with about 65 people from 10 different countries on each one of those trips, and then facilitated another four groups that were able to get people into Gaza. Um, all of them committed coming back to talk in their communities, to write articles, to speak about it. Well, during that time that we were actually physically taking people into Gaza, there was another group called the Free Gaza Movement that had started in 2008 trying to break the siege of Gaza by taking uh, ships into Gaza, or boats. They're not really ships. They're more boats, big boats, uh, 30, 40 foot kind of super cabin cruiser sort of things. Um, and in 2000, uh, Eight, from about April until September, the Israeli Navy allowed five of those small boats to go into Gaza. And it was the first time that, that boats had gone into Ga the port of Gaza, apparently, international boats, in 43 years. But with the, with the uh, attack uh, in December of 2009, uh, the Israelis took a very different turn after that, that each of the Three successive boats in 2009 were each stopped at sea, uh, the last one of them being rammed uh, in 2000, Jan June of 2009, being rammed. Uh, on board was a Nobel Peace Laureate, Marie McGuire, and a former U.S. Congressman, Congresswoman and presidential candidate, 
uh, Cynthia McKinney. All of the people on that, that boat were imprisoned uh, for 10 days in the Israeli prison and then deported.